Uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, my privilege to introduce our opening speaker for our Religious Liberty Weekend here at Village Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, his name is Brother Jonathan Cherney, Esquire. He is an attorney and a CPA. His law practice focuses on helping those who have suffered religious discrimination in the workplace, as well as estate planning. Uh, Mr. Cherney was one of the attorneys in the Supreme Court case, uh, known as the Goff case, uh, which was won in 2023, which represented a significant victory for religious liberty in the workplace. He also serves as the Associate Director of American Christian Ministries. That is a ministry dedicated to spreading the three angels' messages without compromise. Uh, Mr. Cherney has spoken at our Religious Liberty events in the past. We've been blessed by his presentations, and we're delighted that he's come up to share with us here this evening. And uh, before Mr. Cherney um, shares with us, I invite you to bow your heads as I pray for God's blessing upon him. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you give your gifts liberally to your people. And Father, I thank you that you've raised up Mr. Cherney to be a champion for your people in the law courts of this land. Father, I thank you that he has a mind that is sharp and a heart that is soft to your, the promptings of your spirit. And now, Lord, as he shares with us this evening, I pray that the message you've placed upon his heart will take root within our hearts and minds. I pray, Lord, it will bring hope and comfort to Adventists scattered around the world. And Father, may it remind us that you're on your throne. You know when a sparrow falls to the ground, and one day all things will be made new again. So, Father, bless him now with your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, good evening. Happy almost Sabbath. It is well, about an hour probably till Sabbath. I asked to, to speak before sundown uh, because my presentation is more legalese than spiritual. So for those of you tuning in on Sabbath hours, just wanted to give that caveat. You can make your decision uh, when you want to listen to it. Uh, but we're going to be talking about legal challenges to the COVID vaccine mandates. I've been in the trenches uh, working on uh, religious accommodation cases uh, to the COVID vaccine. Uh, right now I have about 50 clients with active lawsuits going across the country uh, for being terminated or other adverse actions that they've incurred because they refuse to get vaccinated uh, due to their sincerely held religious beliefs. Uh, so uh, people have asked me, hey, you know, how's it going? What, what's happening with these cases? And so uh, that's what my presentation is going to be about this evening. Okay, so uh, just a little advertisement. I am the Associate Director of American Christian Ministries. We have some great audio uh, messages on there going back to the uh, 1970s of Adventist uh, pastors and evangelists. And so if you want to listen to some uh, good Adventist preaching, uh, feel free to download our app, go to our website, and you can find a whole list of speakers, uh, some recent speakers, some uh, that have passed away that you'll recognize that you can hear their messages again. And so I hope you can take advantage of that resource. Okay, before we get started, I think it is helpful for to kind of lay a foundation of our judicial system here in the United States. We have two court systems. One is the state courts, and then we have the federal court system. And the federal court system was set up, Article 3 of our Constitution, uh, where it set up the judicial power in one Supreme Court, and then it gave Congress the power to create lower courts. And so Congress did that. You guys might recognize that courthouse there. Hopefully you haven't had to visit that courthouse, but I think that's the local courthouse here in Berrien County. So uh, the Congress set up a kind of three-tier court system. So you have your lower court, uh, your trial court. This is also called the district court. 
And that's where cases are brought originally. If you have a complaint against somebody or some entity, uh, you would bring that first in the district court. And then if you don't like the outcome there, you would appeal to the appellate court or the court of appeals, also known as the circuit court. And then after that is the Supreme Court. And state courts have the same uh, three-tiered setup. You have your trial court, your appellate court, and then your state Supreme Court. And uh, from the state Supreme Court, though, depending on the issue, if it's a, a federal issue, that could also be appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And so uh, depending on the uh, grievance that you have, what it's based on, uh, would depend on what court you go into. Now, our federal court system is broken up into circuits. So this is the appellate courts. Uh, you have 11 numerical uh, circuits that cover different states across the country. Then you have the DC and federal circuit that handle uh, just specific type of cases like patents and things like that. And so uh, if you file a case here in Michigan in your local uh, Michigan Federal District Court, you would appeal that to the Sixth Circuit. If I was filing a case in California and I lost and wanted to appeal, that would be the Ninth Circuit. And so then that Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, they would pass a ruling on my case and then all the district courts in that territory have to follow that ruling as precedent. And so when the Ninth Circuit rules, you know, those uh, eight or nine states that you see there in yellow all have to follow uh, what the Ninth Circuit said, the district courts in that. So you can cite the uh, appellate courts as precedent. Of course, the Supreme Court, every uh, circuit and every federal uh, district court has to follow the Supreme Court precedent. Now, if you get a good ruling in a Ninth Circuit case, um, and you have a case that touches on that point in, say, the Sixth Circuit, you can cite it as persuasive uh, opinion, and you know, typically circuit courts will look at what other circuits are ruling on an issue uh, before they come out with their own ruling. And so you know, even though the uh, circuit uh, courts are all in the same playing field, it is persuasive authority. Uh, to one another. <clears throat> so that's kind of the basics of how our court system works. <clears throat> so how are COVID vaccine accommodation cases going? Well, uh, at the district court level, really it depends. Uh, it depends on the district judge. So when you file a case in court, the defendant or employer for purposes of what I'm talking about, uh, they have to answer either by filing an answer saying we didn't do anything wrong or they can file a motion to uh, dismiss the case you know, without answering at all. And so well, I've been experiencing in a lot of these COVID cases that em employers are just trying to dismiss it. They're trying to say, hey, there is no religious belief against vaccines and even if there was, it would be an undue hardship so the court should dis dismiss it. And so it really depends on what the district judge, uh, what their philosophy is. Are they, um, are they, you know, what their thoughts are against or for uh, the vaccine is kind of what I'm finding. Uh, for the most part, though, you know, many district courts have been balanced at applying the law and not letting their politics uh, get to the issue. Uh, I had a case uh, in California, actually it was a group of uh, teachers, and this is a current case, and the, we filed separate complaints in the district court, and uh, my, my clients were really great. They would get together and they would pray, and they prayed specifically about their judge and who their who would be handling the case? Because a lot of it, you know, does come down to, you know, 
uh, what your judge thinks on an issue, sadly. And so, you know, they were praying and praying, and, you know, the defendant had filed a motion to dismiss the case, and the, the judge had actually entered a tentative ruling. So typically, uh, judges will sometimes enter a ruling a couple days in advance before the hearing, so then you can prepare to argue it, so you kind of know where the judge is thinking. Well, the judge had issued a ruling to, uh, to get rid of our case, saying that you know the school system had immunity and we couldn't sue them. And you know my clients were praying. The defendant uh, did not, must have not seen the ruling. I don't know. They filed a motion to consolidate all the cases, and thankfully. That motion got passed while my case, while the, before the hearing was, and the court system consolidated them all with a different judge that was very favorable to our position. And so I just thought it was neat, you know, the power of prayer uh, and, you know, even the small things like who your judge is. You know, it's important to pray uh, about those things and all things. And so, that, you know, we're, we've been able to proceed in that case. Uh, so with the circuit courts, uh, which are the higher level courts that we showed you, uh, we have had some really great opinions coming down from the circuit courts. In fact, all the circuit courts have ruled on a COVID vaccination issue, all the numerical circuit courts, except for the fourth circuit. And every circuit, except for the Second Circuit, if you're in New York, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe you want to move, I don't know. Uh, but all the other circuit courts have been favorable, you know, finding uh, that, you know, these are religious liberty issues. And, uh, you know, the Fourth Circuit hasn't ruled on uh, the issue yet, but their district courts, from, what, from my research, what I found is that all of those district courts have allowed these cases to proceed, and so that's probably why there's not an appeal uh, or, or there hasn't been a decision in those courts. So we're getting some very favorable decisions from these circuit courts. And so that's very helpful because that sets a precedent in all of the district courts in that territory. So, you know, we've had about four very favorable circuit court opinions in the Ninth Circuit. And so now every district court from, you know, uh, California, Oregon, Washington, they all have to follow that Ninth Circuit precedent. So even if a judge is likely or leans towards uh, throwing out a religious accommodation case, uh, they are bound to the precedent of the Ninth Circuit. And so that has been very helpful. And so we're going to look at some of those uh, circuit court opinions, and we're going to look at uh, specifically some of the language that these uh, circuit court justices have stated. They, they give us some good nuggets uh, that help us uh, with our, uh, our ability to get religious accommodations in the workplace. Uh, so I've settled about six of these cases so far. Like I said, I have about 50 uh, actively going right now. And employers are understanding, because of these all these circuit court of, opinions, employers are understanding that, uh, starting to understand that, hey, this is, this is an issue. And the beautiful thing about religious discrimination cases is that if an employer loses, they not only have to pay what the jury awards my client, you know, they have to pay their attorneys as well, but they're going to have to pay my attorney fees also. So there's a fee-shifting statute that requires them to pay all of uh, uh, my fees or the, the employee's attorney's fees. And that just goes one way. So if, if we lose, if the employee loses, they don't have to pay their fees. And so it's very helpful 
in that it doesn't discourage employees from coming forward when they've suffered discrimination. And it also puts uh, the uh, more pressure on the employer to settle the case. And so I've settled, uh, like I said, six of these cases. I've gotten about $1.2 million for my clients in these six cases. And so employers are understanding that, hey, you know, this is a real uh, issue. This is a real uh, legal issue and that they have uh, not made the best decision. And we've also seen some uh, a record number of discrimination uh, cases filed. So it's interesting because, you know, during this COVID pandemic, we've heard lots of noise about how this is not a religious liberty issue. I don't know if any of you heard any of that, but we heard that from doctors. We heard it from pastors, uh, from religious liberty leaders, that this is not a religious liberty issue. But what we're going to see tonight is that the judicial system clearly understands that no, this is a religious liberty issue. And uh, the EEOC has recognized that this is a religious liberty issue. You know, religious liberty issues are dependent on the individual, right? It's not dependent on the institution. It's not dependent on, you know, what other people think. But religious liberty issues are dependent on your personal conviction. And a lot of times I think we get confused with that. If you feel convicted by God to do something or not to do something, you know, that is a religious liberty issue for you. It might not be for me. You know, I, I gave a talk at Loma Linda, and you can look it up on American Christian Ministries uh, app uh, called What is a Religious Liberty Issue? And we go through, I go through, you know, what is a religious liberty issue? And it's dependent on the person. It depends on, uh, you know, why you are doing something. You know, if, if you are wearing a skirt because you like the way it looks, that's not a religious liberty issue. But there are sincere people in our church and other denominations, sincere uh, women who feel that they should only wear skirts. And for them, that is a religious liberty issue. And who are we, the church or anybody else, to say, no, that's not a religious liberty issue, right? You know, it might not be for me, but who am I to tell somebody else that God is not speaking to them and convicting them a certain way? And the same is true with vaccination. You know, whether God was speaking to you to get vaccinated or not to, then, you know, you should follow your conviction regardless of what the church or anybody else says about it. Uh, but if the, if the reason that you are doing that act is because of what God has showed you or your conviction based on studying the Bible, that is a religious liberty issue. And no one can tell you different. If you're doing it for other reasons, political reasons or scientific reasons, then maybe it's not a religious liberty issue. But it's really subjective to the individual. And courts get this. And hopefully our church gets this. And hopefully our doctors, our religious liberty leaders, and our pastors get it. We had record religious discrimination charges filed with the EEOC. You can see that here in this chart. Uh, we've had, you know, two, 3,000 claims of religious discrimination over the years. It's been pretty steady over the past couple decades. Then in 2022, it jumped up to 13,814 charges. Or actually, <clears throat> yes, of discrimination. And so there's, there was this huge jump. And why is that? It's because of all the COVID vaccine mandates that came out in the fall of 2021 and people being terminated 
for not following their sincere religious beliefs. And so you see this huge rise, and, and it extended some into 2023. It'll be interesting to see what the numbers are this year. Uh, and the EEOC uh, resolved a handful, uh, a good number of them, and got settlements uh, of those resolved, 730 of them. Uh, you can go on the EEOC's website. They received $12.8 million in settlements for these individuals uh, who were uh, wrongfully terminated because of their uh, sincere religious beliefs. That was in 2022. In 2023, uh, they, their settlements just on religious discrimination charges has been $22.3 million. And so employers, employers are understanding that they messed up. They wouldn't be paying $22.3 million if they didn't realize that. And they realize that, hey, this is a religious liberty issue and we're on the wrong side of the law. Ascension Health uh, here in uh, Michigan, uh, they're all over, but uh, they have some hospitals and all here. They settled a class action lawsuit, agreed to settle it, for $10.5 million for all of their workers who were terminated uh, because they wouldn't get vaccinated for, uh, because of their sincere religious beliefs. And so if vaccination is not a religious liberty issue, why are all these companies paying so much to settle these lawsuits? Why aren't they going to the mat on these? Uh, in fact, the EEOC has taken some companies to the mat. This was a, uh, a press release not too long ago. Hank's Furniture required everyone to get vaccinated, refused to give religious accommodations, and the EEOC went after them, got $110,000 for the individual that was fired, and required Hank's Furniture not only to pay that, but require them to adopt policies in writing that provide employees with religious accommodations and then train all of their managers and supervisors on that policy. And so employers are learning that they can't just kick religious uh, issues to the side. Here's another a case that was settled last year, the Department of Defense. All of our military service men and women who fought so hard for our country uh, but were unwilling to, uh, unwilling to get vaccinated due to their sincerely held religious beliefs were involuntarily discharged, some dishonorably discharged. And was a clear violation of our constitutional rights. And fortunately, we had attorneys uh, that were willing to represent them, and they got a settlement of $1.8 million, and uh, the judge issued a injunction telling the Department of Defense that they cannot uh, discharge service men and women because of following their religious convictions. And all of those dishonorable discharges had to be rescinded as well. And so we're seeing some good movement happening in our courts. Here's another recent case. Uh, the University of California, UC Davis, refused to allow a student to re-enroll because they would not receive the COVID vaccine due to their sincerely held religious belief. And some, uh, the, the student filed a lawsuit and the judge issued a temporary restraining order against the school, telling them that they have to allow the student to register for classes and enroll. And because of that, the UC school system uh, decided to allow religious accommodations to their COVID vaccine mandate. And so now over 295,000 students are able to follow their sincerely held religious beliefs and still get an education. We shouldn't have to put our 
livelihood, our education, our financial stability on the line because we are following the convictions that God has given to us. And so I'm thankful that courts are recognizing that. Here, we've, so I've searched and I've only found two cases that have actually gone to trial so far. There might be more out there, but they're not reported and uh, haven't been circulated in my uh, network. But uh, I'm going to show you the two cases right here. This is the first one. Uh, This was in Tennessee uh, against Blue Cross Blue Shield. They required their employees to be, uh, all of them to be vaccinated. Now, uh, this lady who was working for Blue Cross Blue Shield, she had a completely remote job. Like they had no interest whatsoever in her being vaccinated or not. She had no in-person contact with other employees, with contractors, with clients. There was no reason for them to force her to get vaccinated. Well, it went to the jury and a Tennessee jury unanimously ruled in her favor. Ruled to give her 700,000 or just under $700,000 is what, what she won. And, and the jury unanimously found that she had a sincere religious belief. Juries get it. You know, the thankful thing about this is we, when we go to court, we are tried by our peers, right? And, and they get to decide. And juries, you're able to share your religious conviction with your peers in your community. And here they found that she has a sincerely held religious belief and Blue Cross Blue Shield had no, would have incurred no undue hardship to allow her to follow those convictions. And so uh, the other case was out of California. What do you think happened in that jury case? Think it went any different? Well, let's look at this. This was against BART, uh, the Bay Area Rapid Transit. And there, this jury there in San Francisco unanimously found that these seven workers that worked for BART had a sincere religious belief. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? And so, yes, the courts get it, juries get it. This is a religious liberty issue for people. And uh, the jury, though, was hung on whether it would have been an undue hardship for BART to allow these unvaccinated employees to work. So what that means is that means there'll be a new trial with a new jury uh, to decide just that issue of whether it be an undue hardship. So because the first jury already found they have a sincere religious belief, BART cannot contest that fact anymore. I have a couple cases against BART right now. uh, And because of this, they have... Uh, offered my client just this week, actually, a very favorable settlement offer. Uh, And so uh, we'll see what happens in that case. Um, But uh, so so we, the only two cases that I know of, juries are finding that, you know, this is a religious liberty issue for people. And employers, uh, in some cases, it wouldn't be any hardship on them. And I would say in all cases, it would not be a hardship for an employer to allow you to test or mask and do everything they were doing during the pandemic up until October or November of 2021. You know, if, if people could work in the workplace safely for a year and a half, why couldn't they continue to do so with the same precautions that they were required to take beforehand? And so I honestly don't believe that any company, any employer has any hardship in accommodating people for being unvaccinated. And what supports this is the fact that you look at some of our healthcare systems, like Kaiser. I have a whole bunch of cases against Kaiser. 
they received 16,000 requests for religious accommodation. And they granted 10,000 of them. They granted 10,000 requests. So clearly it's not an undue hardship for doctors and nurses and, and other medical professionals to be working with patients. If Kaiser can grant 10,000 accommodations dealing with the most vulnerable of the population, you know, anybody else can as well. And I know some of our hospitals, Loma Linda, uh, from what I've heard, granted every request for religious accommodation. And so employers have no basis for denying employees' uh, requests for religious accommodation. That's why I think we're getting such uh, favorable uh, settlements uh, coming out of this. <clears throat> so those were the two uh, jury cases. I have three uh, juries trials scheduled for this fall, so keep me in prayer if they all go forward. Uh, it's going to be a busy fall for me, but uh, hopefully, you know, we can continue to make uh, headway and let employers know that next time this happens, you know, they're already talking about a next time for the pandemic. Next time this happens, you know, they better think twice about the decisions that they make. So, some questions, uh, you know, did your employer violate the law? You know, I've gotten lots of calls within the last couple months saying, hey, you know, I was fired for COVID, can you help me? Well, it's probably too late. It's probably too late, sadly. For federal discrimination violations, you have to file a charge within 180 to 300 days after the adverse action. So after the termination or other adverse event. Uh, most states mirror that, 180 to 300 days. There are some states, though, that have two or three year statutes of limitations. Uh, you know, most people were fired in the fall of 2021. So we're coming up to the three year limit for the few states. I think it's only California and New York uh, that have a three-year statute. Um, I think the rest here, Arkansas, D.C., Florida, Idaho, I think those are all two-year, but anyways, uh, if I didn't say this at the beginning, this is not legal advice. I'm an attorney. My lips are moving, but I'm not giving legal advice, okay? Uh, th this is just for informational purposes only, so uh, you want to check with, with a, a local attorney to see if you still are able to bring a claim. Uh, but, uh, you know, if your employer did violate the law, you know, I hope you filed a discrimination charge, and uh, if not, you know, consider doing so if it happens again, because it holds employers accountable and it helps other people in the workplace. And it, and it helps keep this from happening again, honestly. This is a case uh, out of the First Circuit, Bazinet birth, uh, Beth Israel uh, Health System. And in that case, Amanda Bazinet, she worked as an office manager in one of the hospitals there in Massachusetts. And she uh, worked during the height of the pandemic. All during COVID, she went in to the office, relying on the hospital's assurances that if they tested and masked, they would be safe in the office. And so she came into work and did her duties, helping keep the office running, uh, helping keep the hospital running to help those. Uh, and, but then uh, the hospital mandated the vaccine and denied her religious belief. And all of a sudden, it wasn't safe to come in with masking and testing. And, um, you know, they denied her request for a religious accommodation. Now, Ms. Bazinet had told the hospital that she believed that abortion is a sin and that she would be violating her faith if she injected the vaccines into her body that contained or were tested on aborted fetal cell lines. And she found a form on the internet that encapsulated those beliefs and she submitted it to the hospital. And her request was denied you know, the hospital stated that 
she, uh, you know, you just copy and paste this. This isn't sincere religious belief. And so she filed a charge with the EEOC and then filed a lawsuit. And what's interesting in this case, most of the time in my cases, the defendant files a motion to dismiss, trying to throw it out before we ever even get to do discovery and find out what the facts are. In this case, the judge on his own just threw out the case before the defendant even did anything. Like, that's when you know you really have the deck stacked against you, right? I mean, it's bad enough having to go up a big, against a big corporate you know, employer with their corporate attorneys, but here the judge is throwing out your case without in, even a request from the defendant. And so the judge said, hey, she doesn't have a sincere religious belief, said the unvaccinated health care workers uh, is, said, you know, it's an undue hardship because of the health and safety risk. So completely ignored the fact that she had been, you know, able to work there a year and a half without any problem and was told that it would be safe to do so. And then the judge claimed that because there are many Christians who oppose abortion and who still get vaccinated, that Ms. Bazinet's beliefs are not religious. So the judge proceeded to tell the client, never met her before, tell her what her religious beliefs are. The hospital claimed that because she copied and pasted her religious belief on, from the internet that her beliefs aren't sincere and that her beliefs are wrong they also claim that her beliefs are wrong because the vaccines weren't developed from aborted fetal tissue. So they said she couldn't be accommodated because she has wrong beliefs. And so this was their, their claim. And she appealed the decision to the First Circuit. And this is what the First Circuit held. The First Circuit Court of Appeals, which all the other uh, district courts have to follow in that circuit, how the fact that many Christians have elected to receive the vaccine does not undermine a particular employee's religious beliefs on the subject. Isn't that a wonderful nugget? I mean, that's, that's the state of the law, right? That's religious liberty. Just because all the other Christians are doing something, if you're convicted to do something different, convicted by God, your religious belief is still something that America values to protect and something that our courts must protect. The First Circuit got it right. They also said whether few or many share that religious view is irrelevant. It doesn't matter how many people share it. What matters is, were you following a religious conviction or some other form of conviction? They also said the law does not require that a religious practice or belief at issue be acceptable, logical, consistent, or comprehensible to others. And this was a quote actually from a Supreme Court case, uh, the uh, Thomas case that they were quoting. And so your religious belief, it doesn't have to be logical to your employer for them to be required to accommodate it. And so if keeping the Sabbath isn't logical, your employer still has to accommodate that belief short of undue hardship. If your belief that God will protect you Better than the vaccine? Maybe your employer doesn't think that is logical. But your employer is required to accommodate that belief unless it would be an undue hardship. The First Circuit also held that the hospital disputes Bazinet's factual foundation for her belief about the development of, of the vaccine. The fact that it disputes it does not change the religious character of the belief. So just because they think hey, the foundation of her belief is false, it doesn't mean it's not a religious belief. And they also found that Bazinet found information on the internet, the fact that she found information on the internet which coincided with her professed religious beliefs does not establish that her beliefs are insincere. And so just because you find something that matches what you believe on the internet doesn't mean it's insincere. And so the first thing I said, wait a minute, you know, district court, what you did was wrong. And so it sent it back and allowed the case to go forward. Are unvaccinated healthcare workers such a health risk that it is impossible to accommodate them? I already touched on this a little bit, but we've had a couple cases rule on this, both from the First Circuit and Bazinet talked about this and the Ninth Circuit. 
in the uh, Buca versus Washington State University. I filed an amicus brief in that case, uh, urging the Ninth Circuit to find that healthcare workers can be accommodated without undue hardship, and thankfully, uh, they did. They followed the Groff case, which was my Supreme Court case from last term that I came here and spoke about, saying that it's a fact-specific inquiry about whether uh, someone can or cannot be receive uh, an accommodation short of undue hardship. And so they reversed those trial courts and sent it back down to allow the facts to be developed uh, to determine whether uh, those, whether there would be an undue hardship or not. And it said, uh, citing Groff, it said, courts must take into account all relevant factors in the case at hand, including the particular accommodations at issue and their practical impact in light of the nature, size, and operating cost of the employer. And so the employer really has the burden to show why, you know, it cannot accommodate uh, just as it had been doing for the last uh, year and a half with unvaccinated individuals in the workplace. Here's a question uh, that I get a lot. What if in addition to religious beliefs, what if you have political or scientific or personal beliefs that aren't religious for reasons why you're not getting vaccinated or, or reasons why you have a, you're, you're taking a certain action? What if there's a mixture of religious beliefs and other beliefs? Does that mixture negate the employer's duty to accommodate the religious aspect of your beliefs? I'm seeing this a lot in my cases where employers are saying, well, you know, they kind of, they were concerned about the safety of the vaccine or, you know, they were kind of uh, talking about the, the political aspect of it. And so, you know, because, you know, they mix the two, you know, it's really not, a, uh, you know, it's not protected, it's not a protected religious belief. But you can have both religious and scientific or religious and political reasons for uh, your beliefs. In fact, my belief in creation is based on both religious and scientific beliefs. Does that mean my uh, religious belief isn't religious? I believe in a worldwide flood that occurred less than 6,000 years ago. I believe that for scientific reasons. I also believe that for religious reasons. Does that mean that it's not a religious belief because I believe it for scientific reasons as well? Well, some courts are saying yes, district courts, but let's see what the, seven, the Sixth Circuit said. Right here, actually, uh, covers Michigan. This was a case, Lucky v. Landmark Medical of Michigan. And there the district judge dismissed the case because uh, they said that her religion does not have a specific tenet or principle that prevents her from being vaccinated. So this was a big problem. You know, and it, it was a problem with our church as well, where we took a stance on the vaccine and said that it's not a religious liberty issue. We said that in the 2015 statement, and then we reaffirmed that in the 2021 statement. But as we know, as I've already explained, religious liberty issue is based on the individual. It's not based on the church. And so uh, that statement has harmed a lot of individuals. I received a lot of emails from HR personnel saying we're not accommodating your client because your church has this belief, and they would copy and paste those beliefs. And a lot of church members were harmed by those statements, sadly. And even judges have said, hey, your church doesn't have this belief, and so we're not accommodating you. But thankfully, that's not the law. The judge got it wrong, and I think our church got it wrong, too. We can have a statement that supports the government's ability to manage health, medical issues, pandemics, and also support the religious convictions of our members. If we would just work at retooling our statement, we could have a statement that does both. 
And I would love it for, if, if our church ever wanted to revisit that, uh, to help our members, because I believe, truly, that this will be an issue again. But thankfully, the circuit courts have found that this isn't the law of the land. It doesn't matter what your church statement is. It doesn't matter what the Pope says. If you believe, if you are part of that organization, but you believe differently, the Seventh Circuit, or the Sixth Circuit, other circuits as well, have said, because your religion doesn't have a specific tenet against vaccination, doesn't mean that the member does not have a sincere religious belief. And so they reversed the district court there. The district court had held that naked assertions devoid of further factual enhancement, uh, that, that her beliefs were naked assertions devoid of further factual enhancement. So the district court was really hostile here. In this case, Lucky was a non-denominational Christian, and she had prayed to God specifically about whether or not to get the vaccine. And she felt God tell her, and I quote, from the case that she would suffer spiritual harm if she received the vaccine. And the district court said, well, her, religion, her church doesn't believe that. And so we don't care if she would, feels she would suffer spiritual harm. It's not a religious issue. Fortunately, she appealed. And the district court, I mean, the, the circuit court, the Sixth Circuit reversed and said, courts must not presume to determine the place of a particular belief in a religion or the plausibility of a religious claim. So it's not for the courts to decide who's right. Is the church member right, or is the ecclesiastical body or authority right? Courts aren't to decide that, right? Uh, <clears throat> the courts are supposed to take the individual uh, for their belief, their sincere belief. And they further said, it is not within the judicial king to question the centrality of particular beliefs or practices to a faith, or the validity of particular litigants' interpretations of those creeds. So even if you interpret things differently than other uh, members or pastors of your church, the, the court isn't to decide, well, you know, this person interprets it differently than this person, so you're wrong. No, both can have a sincerely held religious belief. They're just different, and that's okay. Some person, this person can be convicted that they should get vaccinated. This person can be convicted that they're not. And both beliefs should be protected. We also had a Seventh Circuit case. And notice all these circuit court cases are against healthcare facilities. <clears throat> Uh, this was uh, the Passarella versus Spiris Health. And in that case, Megan Passarella, she worked as a nurse at a hospital in Wisconsin. She sought a religious exemption to its vaccine mandate. Uh, the vaccines, uh, she said, could pose a danger to her body in the form of blood clots, heart inflammation. And after prayerful consideration, she did not feel at peace about receiving the vaccine because it might hurt her body, which is God's temple. And so her employer denied it, said, no, that's a safety issue. It's not a religious issue. And so they fired her. And uh, then she filed a complaint in court. And the district court said, well, yep, yeah, that's rooted in safety. She was concerned about, you know, blood clots and heart inflammation. And so it's not a religious issue. And so because there's no religious belief that would prevent her from taking the vaccine, if she believed it was safe, that it's not a religious issue. But just because you do something because it's safe or not, doesn't mean, just because you would otherwise do something if it was safe, doesn't mean it's not a religious issue. And I don't know if I said that right. I got up at 3 a.m. for my flight, so forgive me if I said that backwards. Okay, anyways. I mean, we have the example of Christ, tempted by Satan, right? He was taken to the top 
of the temple and told to jump off. Now, he didn't jump off because it wouldn't be safe. That was at least one reason, right? Because then God would have to interpose to save him. You know, if Satan had taken him, you know, to the top of that chair and said, jump off, you know, that wouldn't be testing God. You know, he arguably could have done that without uh, uh, putting God to the test or violating, violating any law. And so just because, something, just because you're doing something because of a safety issue, it might still have religious motivations for why you're doing it. And the Seventh Circuit got it. The Seventh Circuit got it. They said, look, an employee may object to an employer's vaccine mandate on both religious and non-religious grounds. And you still have to accommodate the religious basis. A belief is protected as long as some aspect of the request is based on the employee's religious observance, practice, or belief. The fact that an accommodation request turns upon secular considerations does not negate its religious nature. And so this has been huge for a lot of my cases because a lot of my clients, they have been concerned about the safety, but they also have made decisions based on prayer or uh, other religious uh, reasons for not getting vaccinated. And the circuit courts have said, you must still accommodate those religious beliefs. So that's the seventh circuit. Let's look at the eighth circuit. This was uh, Ringhofer versus the Mayo Clinic. And their five employees sued the Mayo Clinic for terminating them because they refused the vaccine due to sincere religious beliefs. Uh, Ringhofer believed his body was the temple of the Holy Spirit and that it would violate his temple to put aborted fetal tissues into it. Uh, another one of the plaintiffs, Reuben, believed that the Spirit dwells in her and she believes her body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. She has a, is bound to honor it and does not believe in putting unnecessary vaccines or medications into her body. So the district judge dismissed the case because Again, many Christians got vaccinated and there is no Christian religious belief against vaccination. That's what the judge said. Well, judge, you're wrong. He also said some of the beliefs alleged are personal or medical and not solely religious. And so here the Eighth Circuit, like the Seventh Circuit that we just saw, also held overlap between a religious and political views does not place it outside the scope of the law's protection. And so just because you have political views about an issue, if you also have religious views, your employer still has to accommodate the religious aspect of your beliefs. Protection of religious beliefs is not limited to beliefs which are shared by all members of a religious sect. And that's our eighth circuit. So all those states there in the eighth circuit now have gotten this direction. And, and so these district court judges cannot go astray. Can employers force you to receive a medical treatment? What do you think? Doesn't, doesn't sound right, right? <clears throat> well, in California, uh, the very first provision of the California Constitution is the right to privacy. And you have both informational privacy, uh, this means privacy about information, uh, your religion or your medical history. Uh, you also have uh, autonomy privacy, privacy to yourself, your being. And uh, so we are bringing uh, constitutional privacy claims against employers for uh, forcing clients, forcing their employees to violate their uh, their privacy. And we have, we have a great case here. And I just want to read a, a snippet from it. It says, employees do not forfeit the right to privacy by virtue of being employed. So this doesn't have anything to do with religion. This is just the fact that you have a right to decide whether you want a medical treatment or not. I mean, sounds absurd, right? You know? And uh, this is a case, Pettus v. Cole, and it's an appellate court decision. It says, We are aware of no law which suggests that a person forfeits his or her right of medical self-determination 
by entering into an employment relationship. And so just because you enter into an employment relationship doesn't mean your employer can tell you what course of medical treatment you have to take for whatever illness or sickness or, or medical issue you have. And the court went on, indeed, it would be unprecedented for this court to hold that an employer may dictate to an employee the course of medical treatment he or she must follow under pain of termination with respect to a non-occupational illness or injury. It is thus eminently reasonable for employees to expect that their employers will respect, not attempt to coerce or otherwise interfere with their decisions about their own health care. <clears throat> I have a case against Kaiser right now, one of my Kaiser cases, where uh, I was, my client was part of the 6,000 that didn't get accommodated, and they were fully remote. They were a fully remote worker. They never met with patients. They never met with coworkers. They worked from home, and, and Kaiser refused to accommodate them and fired them because they would not get vaccinated. Kaiser has no business necessity for requiring my client to make a certain medical decision that has no bearing whatsoever on any of its business. And so we have this, uh, this privacy right. Now she had, she requested a accommodation based on her sincerely held religious beliefs as well. Uh, so we have claims for violating her sincere religious beliefs, but also claims for violating her privacy. You know, you have anatomical privacy. An employer cannot force you to put uh, certain medications into your body. You know, that seems like a basic right. Uh, <clears throat> there was a, another case, Dr. Christopher Rake, uh, who worked for the hospital for UC California, University of California Hospitals, and he filed a suit uh, for violation of his medical privacy. I don't believe he had a religious accommodation case. He was just claiming his right to privacy. And the employer, Kaiser, or sorry, not Kaiser, uh, UC system tried to throw out the case, and the court has allowed it to proceed it on the uh, privacy issue. So, you know, uh, I think, you know, the more we bring these cases, the more they let employers know that they can't tread on people's constitutional rights. Now, there was a case in the Ninth Circuit, uh, the, oh, that's my timer, about up. Real quick, I want to touch on this case. Uh, this was the Health Freedom Defense Fund versus Los Angeles Unified School District, and this was a case where the LA Unified School District uh, required employees to get vaccinated or lose their jobs. And so plaintiffs, uh, employees sued, seeking an injunction against the, the school to allow them to continue teaching and working for the school. And uh, they lost at the district court and they appealed to the Ninth Circuit. And uh, the Ninth Circuit, uh, what's been circ circulating in the news is that they held that the COVID jabs are not traditional vaccines because uh, they are a medical treatment. They don't prevent the spread of COVID and thus they're not a traditional vaccine. Now that is not what the circuit court held. Uh, other things that have been circulating are employers cannot mandate the COVID vaccine because it is unconstitutional. That's not what they held either. So what they did held though is that the principle of vaccination is to prevent the spread of disease. Now they said the facts in this case hadn't been developed. Uh, the district judge threw it out after the complaint was filed at the very beginning. And so the Ninth Circuit said that the plaintiffs had pled that this wasn't a vaccine because it does not prevent the spread. And so all the Ninth Circuit said was that the plaintiffs had adequately pled that and that there needs to be discovery to determine if that is true or not. And a trier of fact, a jury, needs to decide does the COVID vaccines prevent the spread or not? Now, I, we all know it's clear that it doesn't. The CDC has even said that. Uh, so I'm hoping that eventually it comes out, uh, a ruling in our court that says that the vaccination, COVID vaccine was not a vaccine because it does not prevent the spread. But um, you know, that's not what the Ninth Circuit held there. 
They said here the plaintiffs allege the vaccine does not prevent the spread of COVID, but it is a medical treatment to mitigate symptoms. A competent person has a constitutional protected liberty interest in refusing unwanted medical treatment. And I already spoke about that constitutional interest. Uh, the court has cautioned time and again that public employers may not condition employment on the relinquishment of constitutional rights. And so, uh, so we have, you have a constitutional right. You also have a right under statute to receive religious accommodations. So I just want to encourage you that the courts are getting it. The circuit courts are getting it. And for those of you that suffered, who lost their job, who unjustly lost your livelihoods, you know, we are making headway and we are getting some restitution. Uh, people are getting recuperated for the money that they lost, they lost wages from being unjustly fired. Uh, and so just wanted to bring you some good news, uh, hopefully, and encourage you to continue praying for these cases and continue praying for the attorneys, uh, myself and others that are bringing these cases and for the judges uh, that we can get favorable laws and decisions that help advance religious liberty. Thank you so much.